let me open the next session. The next session is on uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. And uh, our next speaker is, the speaker is here, the talk is here as well. Should I bring my laptop? No, 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 you're good. Yeah. Yeah, oh, good. Okay. <laughs> so the next speaker is uh, Sanjeev Arora. Sanjeev Arora is a professor at the Department of Computer Science at Princeton University. He's also uh, affiliated with the Institute of for Advanced Study. Uh, I don't want to go over the long list of awards and prizes that uh, uh, Sanjeev has received. I just mentioned that he's a member of the National Academy of Sciences. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He, he got the award at the Gettysburg <laughs> Prize twice, and he also got the Parkinson Prize once, only once. <laughs> and uh, he's going to talk about the right understanding of deep learning. Well, uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be at DIMAX again. It's been a few years. Um, I used to be somewhat active uh, in the early years. Um, and I'll talk today about uh, theoretical understanding of deep learning. Um, so, yeah, machine learning is in the news. And uh, it, to the extent that it's now been rebranded as artificial intelligence again after many decades. Um, <laughs> And yeah, these are covers of top science journals uh, about breakthroughs in machine learning. And they can uh, play Go better than humans, maybe uh, diagnose cancers in x-rays, or drive cars for getting there, etc. All right, so there are um, multiple uh, such breakthroughs, but the basic idea in machine learning is still an, a very old one, which is curve fitting. Uh, which we all learned in high school, you know, fitting curves to data. So I'll illustrate with a couple of examples. So here's data about inflation versus unemployment uh, for Japan for a certain period. And you squint at it and you realize, well, it's kind of like this line, right? It's, that passes through those points. It's described by this line, and that's called the Phillips curve. So that's an example of curve fitting, just to remind you of what I mean by this. Uh, Here's another example, which is not a curve, but a surface. It's in three variables. Pressure, volume, and temperature of a gas. And that's a gas law. Again, this was discovered empirically by just uh, plotting these points for uh, various values. And then, of course, it was one of the uh, major achievements of statistical physics to explain this uh, by, uh, by more elementary means. Okay, but the important thing is that these laws were discovered by fitting curves to data or surfaces. And machine learning is also like that. It's surface fitting with just with many more variables, millions, tens of millions, billions of variables today. The models being trained these days are that large. And they have to be trained using very uh, powerful new computing technologies. All right, so these curves, when you, when you fit them, correspond to learning patterns of data. So segueing from that to deep learning, deep learning is a form of curve fitting where you're trying to uh, learn a mapping from inputs to outputs. So for example, inputs could be images, and the output is whether it's an image of a dog or a cat. Okay, so the output is one if the image is an image of dog, and zero if it's an image of a cat. And you're only going to input images of dogs and cats. All right, so you're trying to learn this mapping from input to output. And you're going to compute that mapping. You're going to learn to compute that mapping uh, in the following form. That the mapping consists of layers of transformations. And each layer consists of a linear transformation, which means multiplying this vector input. So input I'm thinking of like in pixels. So it's a vector. A vector input uh, by matrix. And then you apply nonlinearity and then a matrix, and then nonlinearity, et cetera, et cetera, for many layers, and then the output comes out at the end. Now, nonlinearity, the, the most popular one is what's called the ReLU nonlinearity, which is the following, that when presented with a vector, you just zero out all the negative entries. So it's a nonlinear transformation. It's a very simple nonlinearity. But there are other nonlinearities people uh, look at. All right, so now what's the curve here? The parameters of the curve are the entries of these matrices. So that's the theta vector 
uh, up there, which is the parameters of this mapping. So those are the parameters. And the data being fitted is the input-output relationship. So examples of inputs and outputs. And how are you going to fit this curve? You're going to do gradient descent on a certain loss. The loss describes how well or how poorly the data is being fitted right now, the input-output relationship. So for every so you initialize with some random value for theta, the, the, the entries of the matrices. And so that's some, that gives you some value of loss. And, and with random matrices, the input-output relationship is going to be random as well, pretty much. So you will not be fitting the data very well. So in this least square objective, which is the output of, the, of this net and the desired label y, if you take the least square fit of those, that'll be pretty bad in the beginning. And then the training algorithm will just compute the gradient of the loss. And remember that negative of gradient is the direction where the loss decreases, and you just update the theta in that direction and continue on. Okay, so you start with random initialization and do gradient descent. All right, so that's a training algorithm, very simple. Of course, in practice, people have all kinds of bells and whistles in this, which I'm not describing. Like different architectures, training, variants of this training algorithm, et cetera. Now, how do you compute the gradient? Now, gradient is just derivatives, okay? Partial derivatives with respect to the, in, uh, to the coordinates, namely the entries of the matrices. And we learn how to compute gradients in calculus. But here, it's a complicated function. It's computed in many layers, right? The parameters are, live in these matrices, and it's a multi-layered function. So, of course, you'll compute the gradient by the chain rule, okay? The function that you're computing is a composition of functions, so you use a chain rule. And the back propagation algorithm, which you may have heard of, is some clever implementation of the chain rule, so that it's efficient. Okay, so that in a slide is deep learning. Okay. Now, um, this has been around for decades, uh, six, seven decades, and it has its ups and downs, and definitely right now is an up phase uh, for deep learning, from, probably from now on. And why, why is it so successful now? You know, one, one reason is that people just didn't believe this could work, okay, and didn't try it on a large enough scale and large enough data. I mean, there were supercomputers back then. They could have tried it, but nobody tried doing deep learning on a supercomputer. And these days, it's, it's possible, and uh, the supercomputers in some sense are living on grad students' desktop, which is the most potent weapon in science, <laughs> giving grad students resources and let them just lose on a problem. And, um, and so once it started working around 2012, um, you know, it's developed rapidly, and now it's morphed into this differential com differentiable computing paradigm, where instead of just this simple net, you may have even multiple nets, so multiple units, which are all linked together. And it's all fine if you can train it in an end-to-end -end way, you know, using some loss function, and just propagate the gradient via chain rule through these different units. So that's the differentiable computing paradigm, which is the the, the next level of deep learning. Okay, so now I'll tell you, that, so uh, we and others are trying to now understand this technique at a theoretical level, at a mathematical level. So mystery one, that efficient optimization is possible. So what do I mean by that? So you, you take data, so like the image data, and you do this gradient descent, and you are doing little steps, updating the parameters by little nudges. And indeed, you find that on the training data, this loss becomes basically zero. So it's fitting the data perfectly, or almost perfectly. So that's what I mean, it works, okay? This is on training data. Now what, of course, you're interested in is what it does on new images that it hasn't seen. But at least the training part is already a mystery. And the reason it's a mystery is that the moment you have these multi-layered models, you know, parameters here, parameters here, and they are sort of feeding into from one to the next, any loss you write of this whole agglomerate is going to be non-convex in this sense, okay? So convex is mathematically nice and probably has been treated in dozens of Dimax programs over the years, convex things. And non-convex is that. And just you look at it even in one dimension, and it's not clear that if you, if you do gradient descent, which is just 
following the slope locally, right? The way water follows the slope. That would ever go to the best possible point, which is over here, right? If you start here, it will just end up here. Okay, so this is non-convex, definitely very non-convex, but somehow gradient descent, this very simple algorithm, um, finds a good solution. Now, just to illustrate what this, this is, why this is mysterious, I mean, gradient descent, you can think of it as tuning knobs, okay? So in this case, in this picture, the knobs represent parameters. Now, remember, the number of parameters is millions or billions, but just in two parameters, so those are two parameters, and then the loss function is the third coordinate. And so the value of the loss function as you plot it against the values of the parameters is this loss surface, and that's the non-convex loss surface. And all gradient descent is doing is it's just tuning it, moving it, moving the knobs a little bit at a time in the direction where the decrease is happening. That's what it's doing. Now, uh, of course, uh, the thing to realize is that, you know, it's not like the, so when, whenever I tell it to, and probably not for this audience, but like to a general audience, when I say this, you know, people say, yeah, we understand how knobs work, right? In your car radio, there are knobs, or used to be until a few years ago. And, um, but it's different from those knobs, right? Because in the car radio, you change the volume, it doesn't affect anything else. But here, you change a knob, and it affects the behavior of the other knobs. Okay, that's the dif difficulty. And so they're all linked under the, you know, under the hood, but somehow this tuning works. All right. Yeah, I, I, I'm guessing all of you know gradient descent, but it's, it's such a mystery, you know, why this works so well. All right. Now, yeah, as I mentioned, there are many empirical tricks for modifying gradient descent or knob structure, which are the architecture. Mystery two. The issue of overfitting. As I mentioned, the point of the training is not to fit the training data. You know, like on these pictures, the network does well. It's what it does on data it hasn't seen, which will be presented in the future. So typically, you would reserve, say, 10% of the data as held out data, and you're going to test on that. And of course, the, the, the interesting thing is that, that in practice, these nets do generalize to held out data. So, so now we get to the issue of overfitting. Now, in this simple example of the Phillips curve that I started with, you know, we squinted at it and said, yeah, it's kind of like a line. But of course, you could fit other curves, something like this, which is too complicated. And yes, it fits the data better, but it wouldn't generalize as well. It wouldn't extend to new data as well. It wouldn't predict as well. And that's a thousand-year-old philosophy, if not more, Occam's razor that all things being equal, the simplest solution tends to be the best one, right? That's why conspiracy theories should be, should be mistrusted, right? They fit all the facts that are known, but then they don't generalize to new facts. So, all right, so yeah, we, we've seen this in science. And the mystery here is that these nets have, as I mentioned, tens of millions or even billions of parameters today. And even though we have a lot of data, we don't train them on that much data. You know, billions of uh, trained data sets, uh, data points, no, we don't do that. So they are being trained with way more parameters than the number of training data. And so the mystery here, it's like the dog in the Sherlock Holmes story. The mystery was not that it barked, but that it didn't bark. The mystery is no overfit. That you can train a model with 50 million parameters on 50,000 examples, and it doesn't overfit. It's like Occam's razor has been suspended. So these are two of the major mysteries of even just pure supervised learning. Now, the deep learning is being applied in all kinds of other ways, as you know, playing Go and uh, understand language, you know, which is unsupervised learning, etc. And I'm not even talking about that today. Okay, that's a longer talk. So let's just talk about these two mysteries. So. People have been uh, uh, trying to understand this mathematically, and I'll give you some vignettes of uh, some things that have been discovered even in the past year or so. So the first vignette is training of infinitely wide deep nets. So infinitely wide I'll define. It's some kind of a limit in the sense of this physics thermodynamic limit. It's also related to the Gaussian process view of deep learning, which I won't talk about. 
it's, I'll say in a second what's infinitely wide matters. But the point here is that in here, provably, there are infinitely many solutions. And gradient descent will pick a meaningful one. OK. So uh, just to make sure that you understand what an infinite net is, here's a simple illustration. So you're going to train it on this very simple data set, UCI primary tumor, multi-class 17-dimensional input, number of training samples of 339. By the way, this is a joke slide almost, because uh, these were the, these UCI data sets. Anybody remembers them here? Yeah. So in, like 20 years ago, this was like people used to train machine learning models on this. So this, you know, elicits a chuckle from the machine learning audience. All right. So, uh, so we're going to train a fully connected five-layer net on it. Now, fully connected means the model I showed you, okay, with those matrices, as opposed to convolutional. Okay, so fully connected five-layer net on it. So it's something like this. So there were these matrices. Remember, five, five layers of matrices. There's an input and output. But to make life difficult, it's going to be infinitely wide. What does that mean? Take these middle layers. Remember these matrices? We're going, uh, we're going to blow them up to infinity. So it's some limited, mathematical limiting process. Imagine doing this training for larger and larger nets, wider and wider nets. But the input and output layers aren't changed. So it's still computing on the same input and it's producing the same kind of output. OK, so that's what we're looking at. Now, as I mentioned, you initialize the network randomly in, during training. So we're going, we're going to initialize it with Gaussians, which is the standard initialization. But it has to be scaled suitably so that this limiting process makes sense Okay, as you go to infinity. Now, turns out, well, firstly, you can think that, uh, well, let's look at the second objection. It's clearly infeasible to train, OK? No amount of computing in the world can train it. But let's look at the first objection. It's too expressive. It clearly overfits the training data. You know, uh, when we teach about uh, uh, neural nets classes, we show students that if you have an infinitely wide net, even with one layer, you can fit any finite data set. OK, it's a simple theorem. So clearly, this is capable of fitting any finite function let alone a function on 339 inputs. So this can clearly overfit and has, as you go to the infinite limit, it has infinitely many solutions. So infinitely many nets that fit this data. Well, so we've trained it anyway, and I'll say in a second how we did it, but you can train it, and you can compute the exact number. And the accuracy was 51.5. This is a multi-class problem. There are multiple outputs, so, so 51.5 is reasonable. And the point here, especially for machine learning audiences, is that on these little data sets, the old champions, like Gaussian kernel and random forest, which is boosted decision trees, they've been hard to beat. Okay? On the little data sets, the old methods still rule. And actually, this one beats it. So we had this paper where we showed that actually, it's actually it actually beats the old champions. Uh, actually, oh, this is, sorry, an old slide. This I'll have a better number for this, CFAR 10. All right, so let me say why you would try to do this and why you would why you can compute with this net, okay? So since we don't understand what happens during training of deep net, you know, all these knobs are, millions of billions of knobs are being tweaked and uh, using the gradient. So the hope here is to do something similar to what the physicist did. So this is the original thermodynamic limit. Uh, so people are trying to understand, you know, things like the gas law, which I started with. And the point is that, you know, those pressure, temperature, et cetera, are rising from molecular motion and molecules are, uh, are uh, moving around and bouncing against each other. And if you look at the distribution of velocities, it's, it's changing over time rapidly, OK? So that's this problem. And the insight of the physicists in the 19th century, Maxwell and Boltzmann and others, was that if you go to the infinite limit, think of the number of molecules being infinite, then this distribution of velocities becomes a distribution, OK? A stationary distribution. I mean, that's the assumption. And then you can, using calculus of variations, solve for the distribution and get a distribution. So we're going to try to do something similar. Okay, as you as a neural net goes to infinity, it uh, you know this, all these nodes that are the matrix entries that are evolving, sort of approach some kind of distribution. Okay, and that's what happens, and you can prove that. Okay, so the first paper along these lines was Jaco et al. and we did it for convolutional neural nets, which is the more important neural nets for practice. And the theorem is that the following is equivalent for any finite data set. You take the infinite-width fully connected net, treat it, uh, trained with gradient descent, 
with infinitesimally, infinitesimally small learning rates. So the rate of change of the parameters as, during training is infinitesimally small. So that model, which I've been talking about, is equivalent to a classical, more classical model, which is kernel least squared regressions with respect to this new kernel, neural tangent kernel, okay, which is defined as part of this theorem, or the convolutional neural tangent kernel. And, and since in the thermodynamic limit, these, these uh, values uh, uh, in the limit go to some distribution, you can actually compute what the net is doing via dynamic programming. So that's what we gave an algorithm for that. Okay, again, dynamic programming is bread and butter in Dimax activities. And uh, you can compute the exact performance of this infinite width net on finite data sets. That's what we did. Okay, so that's the theorem. So this is just uh, it, it's saying a little bit more of what this is. So this equivalent, so this classical model that I mentioned in machine learning is kernel regression. And the kernel idea is that you're taking a representation of the input. So x is the true input, and you're taking a representation in some infinite dimensional space, phi of x. This is called the reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And the point is that even on this infinitely long representation, you can do machine learning, for instance, least square regression, if you can compute inner products of the representations of x1 and x2, given any x1, x2. Okay, that's called the kernel trick. That this least square algorithm all it needs is inner products. And if you can compute inner products, you can do least squares, okay? So, so that's the story that you, you define kernels where that inner product is possible to compute. And this neural tangent kernel is a new kernel which corresponds to this infinitely wide net, randomly initialized. And the corresponding entry in, uh, for, each so for each parameter in the net, there's an entry in this representation. And the corresponding entry is a partial derivative of the output with respect to that parameter. Okay, so that's, it's some bizarre new kernel that people hadn't seen, uh, uh, and, uh, and the algorithm shows how to compute this inner product, and so you can do regression. And so you can compute what this infinitely wide net is doing. Okay? So yeah, as I mentioned on this classic UCI data set, the one that draws a chuckle from machine learning audiences, uh, uh, we show that this NTK actually beats all the classical methods. These, these classical methods have been hard to beat, like boosting and, and uh, Gaussian kernel, et cetera. Also, it beats finite neural nets, actually, on this small data set. And then CIFAR-10 is a classic uh, data set, uh, classic in the last five, six years, that a lot of people uh, do work on. In, uh, it's an image data set. And there, uh, this souped-up CNTK that we came up with, rivals AlexNet. AlexNet was the famous original breakthrough net by the Hinton Group, 2012, uh, which started the modern deep learning revolution. And it got 89% on CIFAR-10, which none of the older methods could match. And people tried pretty hard. And the previous best was 86%. So it, this new souped up CNTK matches that. All right, so that, that was just a vignette, uh, just showing you that there are, you know, it's possible to define infinitely wide nets and understand them. You can prove that they, uh, they converge to a, a good solution, and you can compute the, property, uh, the properties of that solution. Okay, now I'm not suggesting that this is explaining deep learning, because there's a gap between what these NTKs do, you know, these infinite nets do, and what the finite nets do, and there are various reasons for that gap. But anyway, it's, it shows one possible way in which theory can, can suggest really new models and new concepts that Practitioners will never think of infinite nets. All right, uh, vignette two, solving matrix completion via deep linear nets. Uh, this, I believe, might have been covered in some Dimax programs. Another blast from the past, 2007. Uh, so this was when Netflix used to send you DVDs in the mail, and uh, they wanted to recommend DVDs to users, and you would think of it as a, a predicting the missing entry. So there's a user time movie matrix, and the user has rated some movies, a few movies, and so Netflix knows a few entries in this matrix and is trying to predict the remaining entries. So that's matrix completion. And um, so it's formulated as, you know, there's a low rank matrix and you see some entries and you're trying to recover the matrix. So you can do it with, with least square methods, but uh, you, since you want to find a low rank matrix, you put this, what's called the regularizer, which is the sum of singular values of this unknown matrix. Okay, so that's called the 
matrix completion algorithm, the classic one. And I don't have a lot of time, so I'll cut ahead to what we do. So we're going to tr try to solve matrix completion using deep nets, deep linear nets. Okay, we're trying to find a matrix. So we're going to find the matrix as a product of n matrices. Okay, just think of n as 3. Okay, 3 is when this really takes off. So product of three matrices. So now that seems crazy. You're not trying to find a matrix, and, and you're making life harder by actually finding it as a product of three matrices. So those are the variables. Now it turns out that this is exactly like deep learning, but with a linear net. There's no nonlinearity. And you know, if you do gradient descent, it's just like back propagation. Itself. Okay, it's just deep learning, but with a linear net. But, and this is the important thing, you've forgotten about the rank constraint. You're finding this matrix as a product of three matrices. Those are full n by n matrices. You're not putting any kind of rank constraint. So hence, what I say there, you're ignoring the domain knowledge that this matrix you're trying to find is low rank, and you're just trusting back prop, which is like the mantra of deep learning. Forget about domain knowledge. All right. And now, this empirically solves matrix completion better than nuclear norm minimization. Okay, so this is a simple deep learning model where the deep learning does better than the classic, supposedly optimal convex method. Okay? And, uh, and this you can analyze. Okay, it's simple enough that you can analyze. You can analyze the, the differential equations that describe the gradient updates, and you can see how the singular values and singular uh, vectors uh, uh, get, uh, you know, get updated during the training, and you can prove some theorems. Okay. And, and it sort of uh, ruled out some other conject previous conjectures, but I didn't go into those. All right, I'll finish with uh, another quick vignette, which is mode connectivity. Okay, just to show you what kinds of bizarre things are out there, and that at first it looks hopeless to do any theory with them, and then you start being able to do theory. All right, so mode connectivity is a phenomenon that, you know, you, remember you, you train deep nets with random initialization. You can do different random initialization and get different deep nets. And what this phenomenon says is that you can connect these two low cost solutions using a path in the landscape of low cost. Okay, let me illustrate. So like, this is a landscape of solutions. Each point is a possible deep net. A and B were two deep nets you found, which have low cost. Low cost is denoted by warm colors. If you connect A and B, well, every point along that line is another deep net. It's also a value, a value of parameters. So th that's also a deep net, and that, those have high cost. But turns out you can find a third point C, such that the line connecting A and C and B and C both consist only of deep nets with low cost. It's a very bizarre thing. So let me let you visualize that. So the fact that deep net training works from random initialization suggests that the landscape, this lost landscape, has this sinkhole kind of structure. This is a picture from New Zealand. So you start from a random place and walk around a little bit with gradient descent, and you fall into this sinkhole, which is nearby, and that's your deep net. Okay, at the bottom is the deep net you find. All right, and this mode connectivity picture is saying that the bottoms of these sinkholes are linked horizontally by pipes or valleys. So when I saw this a uh, year and a half ago at NeurIPS, and I was thinking, what kind of math will, can explain this? This will take like decades. But actually, you can start doing theory with it. But let me first, uh, I, I guess I won't get time to give you the theory, but I'll let, let me just finish by saying why this is so bizarre, this mode connectivity. Problem. Let's just do it by any two, uh, two layer nets, U1, W1. Okay, there are two nets, theta and theta B. And I just want to show you that this process of connecting them with a the line is really bizarre. Okay, these are two nets that were trained separately. And the line joining them is like this, right, parametric form. It's also, each point on this line is also a deep net. And if you open up this parametric form, you get these kinds of terms. The first term is like the first net. The second term is like the second net. But the in-between terms are the hybrid terms, the top of one net on top of the bottom of the other. And that's a nonsensical net because these nets were trained separately, right? So why should this in general have low cost? And so that's the mathematical mystery, and in this new paper, uh, which, uh, yeah, we, we give some explanation. All right, so concluding thoughts, deep learning is a new frontier for theory, many new avenues, and it seems at first hopeless, but actually there's been a lot of progress in the last few years, and the best theory will emerge from engaging with real data and real deep net training, and because armchair theory will be much less fruitful, and I'm optimistic that deep learning methods can be understood and simplified, 
as Hilbert said, there is no ignor ignorabimus in mathematics. Happy birthday, Danny. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you to the speaker. Uh, we have time for one question. Ah, the choice. Can you do so? You'll, you'll make the selection. I have to pick. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know. How, how do I pick? I know. I'm randomize, not. randomize. <laughs> Random. <laughs> uh, okay, free. Why don't you? You are the one I've known the longest. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, the question was, the question was uh, that uh, doesn't regularization take care of all of this? And no. I mean, there are lots of experiments showing that. Okay. Let's let's see. Thank the speaker again and move to the next. One.